Welcome back. Now let's consider the insects. An early and economically important use of transgenic technology was the genetic engineering of plants that produce their own insecticide. Chemical insecticides kill a lot of things besides the insects they're meant to control. And insecticides accumulate in our bodies and are linked with cancer, particularly in the United States amongst migrant workers who apply the things. And insects are also becoming resistant to conventional insecticides. So instead of spraying the insects themselves, we need to equip the plants with new chemical weapons to defend themselves. And again, we go to our little friends, the bacteria, for help. Bacillus thuringiensis, usually referred to as Bt, produces a crystalline protein shown here in this figure that produces paralysis of an insect's digestive tract, causing it to stop feeding within hours and die within a few days. So the Bt bacteria itself was first used as an insecticide in 1920, and spray formulations containing either Bt bacteria or Bt proteins have been used for more than 40 years for crop protection, including organic farming operations. Well, beginning in the 1980s, the genes responsible for making Bt proteins were isolated and transferred into corn plants. Dr. Brown has already described how this was done. And other Bt proteins have been used to genetically modify potatoes and cotton and many other crops. The Bt toxin is particularly attractive as an insecticide because there are about a hundred different kinds specific to different insects. And they break down quickly in the environment. And they're not toxic to humans and other animals. So what you're looking at now is an adult corn rootworm. The larvae of this beetle are one of the most damaging pests in the United States. The economic impact of the insects in terms of crop damage and the cost of pesticides used to be around $1 billion a year before transgenic corn varieties. You can see how dramatic the effects of the Bt are in this figure with Wade French. He's comparing the tatty threadbare roots of a normal corn plant versus a corn plant which is actually making the Bt toxin. The effects are equally dramatic in other plants. Have a look at these peanuts. Caterpillars extensively damaged the leaves of this unprotected peanut plant. Uh, after only a few bites of this genetically engineered plant, which is containing Bt genes, the caterpillar looked, crawled off the leaf and it died. Well, this sounds great, but there are two mottos to bear in mind with pest control. Firstly, it's always hard to keep a bad pest down, and two, evolution will find a way. A major worry about planting transgenic Bt crops on a very large scale was that it could potentially lead to the evolution of resistant insects. Well, so far, the picture is rosier than anyone predicted. A review published in June 2013 found that Bt crops are largely holding their own after about 15 years of global use. Cases of resistance are rare, cropping up only where farmers fail to cultivate properly. Additionally, increasingly, researchers are producing transgenic plants that carry more than one toxin gene, which makes it much more difficult for insect resistance to arise. Well, microbes like the Bt bacteria that can be used to kill insects are called biocontrol agents or microbial insecticides. My own laboratory has been working on another biocontrol agent, a fungus called Metavisium. And in one of our projects, we've been using it to target mosquitoes and the malaria they carry. Malaria infects um, 300 million new people every year and kills 2 million a year, mostly children. The natural fungus can kill mosquitoes but too slowly to prevent people getting bitten and catching malaria. So we engineered the fungus to express a gene from a scorpion that encodes a powerful toxin completely specific to insects. On the left here is a mozzie killed by a mosquito, killed by the uh, normal wild type fungus. And on the right is one killed by the transgenic uh, metavisium. It only took a few spores of the transgenic to kill the mosquito and they killed much faster. You can see the wings of the insect killed by the transgenic fungus are all spread out. That's due to spasms caused by the toxin. We were concerned that deploying such a potent pathogen could induce resistance to evolve in the mosquitoes. Just as mosquitoes have become resistant to all sorts of insecticides, they'd find some way of evolving resistance to the fungus. So we also developed another strategy and engineered the fungus to express an anti-malarial toxin or human antibody. So what you're looking at is some uh, mosquito blood containing the malaria parasite in red and the wild type natural fungus in green cohabiting in the mosquito blood. 
When we get the fungus to express the anti-malarial antibody or toxin in the mosquito's blood, the malaria is very rapidly killed off. So the mosquito bites are itchy, but otherwise harmless. Well, another goal in generating transgenics is to modify the quality of the uh, produce. For instance, increasing the nutri nutritional value or providing more industrially useful qualities or quantities of the produce. The amphlora potato, for example, produces a more industrially useful blend of starches. They taste terrible, but they're not intended to be eaten. Well, due to lack of acceptance of transgenic crops in Europe in 2012, the German company that developed Amflora relocated its corporate headquarters to the United States. Soybeans and canola have been genetically modified to produce more healthy oils. Pigs are popular with genetic engineers, and likewise have been transformed with a worm gene encoding a fatty acid desaturase that converts heart unhealthy omega-6 fatty acids into heart healthy omega 3s Cows have been engineered to produce more protein in their milk to help cheese production or to resist disease. This pretty lady is Anna, born March the 3rd, 2000. She's a clone of a purebred Jersey calf who sells her modified with genes for producing lysostaphene, which is a protein that kills the staphylococcus bacteria that causes mastitis disease. She's the first transgenic cow clone engineered to resist mastitis which cost the United States dairy industry $1.7 billion annually. Transgenics are also being used as biological factories for producing valuable or rare materials. One example is farming, which uses crops of animals as bioreactors to produce vaccines or drugs. In the poorest countries, many people lack the resources to buy vaccines that could save their lives or, or the means to store them. They have to be kept frozen in many places, freezers and electricity are in short supply. While scientists all over the world are making vaccines much more accessible by engineering edible plants to make them. Plants, as a banana or rice, are chosen, which are easy to cultivate locally and will keep producing the vaccine so it's always fresh. So you'd eat a banana expressing some combination of pathogen proteins that would immunize you against tuberculosis, measles, cholera, hepatitis, pneumonia, or STDs. Scientists are placing particularly high priority on combating the diarrheal agents responsible for about 3 million infant deaths a year, mainly in developing countries. The first vaccines produced with plants are just starting to become available. A new twist on plant technology involves using tobacco plants to treat cancer. That's a tobacco plant genetically reprogrammed with a virus to produce a patient-specific vaccine against lymphoma. The strategy is to identify a gene sequence that's specific for the tumour of a patient and incorporate it into a virus that infects the tobacco. The tobacco produces the protein encoded by the viral genome very rapidly and in extremely high levels. The protein can then be used as a vaccine to trigger the patient's body to attack the cancer. A non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer vaccine from plants is soon entering phase 3 clinical trials. Animals are also being used to produce medicinal products. Several animal proteins are being produced in the milk of cows and sheep or goats in order to treat cystic fibrosis, emphysema and haemophilia. Human proteins expressed in milk are much more likely to function properly than when they're made in bacteria. Perhaps because mammals do some extra chemical modifications of proteins or better folding them up. Well, getting the proteins made in milk means not having to kill the animals to get the protein. You don't want to kill the goose that laid the golden egg to reap the protein harvest. To get a protein produced in milk, the promoter for a milk-specific gene, such as casein, is linked to the coding sequence for the human gene. The DNA is then injected into a fertilized egg and the egg implanted into the uterus of a surrogate mother. The transgenic animals are often cloned so that entire herds of animals can produce useful proteins in this way. Transgenic animals are not confined to producing pharmaceutical proteins. They can produce other kinds of protein as well. I've already mentioned the most way out example, which addresses the question, what you get when you cross a spider with a goat? Well, if you're a biotechnologist, you get goats with spider silk in their milk. Look at these goats. These goats look perfectly normal. They have bright eyes, healthy white coats. They play around exactly as you'd expect young goats to do. To the casual observer and to their keepers, they show no signs that they're not perfectly normal farmyard goats. But they're a long way from normal. These are very special goats. They contain a single gene for the golden orb web spider. 
It's the gene responsible for making drag line. It's the silk that spiders catch themselves with when they fall. It's one of the strongest natural fibers known to man. But it's also light and flexible. It has some amazing properties for any kind of a fiber, so it's not surprising there are many possible medical uses, from artificial ligaments to sutures in surgery. The question was, how do you get a lot of spider silk? You can't farm spiders, they'd eat each other. That's why they put the gene in goats to produce what they call spider goats. Now, to be precise, they're only about one seventy thousandth spider. They have no hint of spider except for the highly prized spider protein in their milk. To find out of the milk, the silk protein produces a syrupy liquid. The real challenge is spinning a super tough fibre. Now the spider does it by spinning the liquid protein through her spinnerets. Tiny holes in the stainless steel plate become man-made spinnerets. The silk protein is pushed through the holes and can form filaments several miles long. But this is the weakest part of the technology. Artificial spinnerets have so far only been able to replicate a strand one-tenth the strength of a spider's drag line. So the eight-legged web spinners have the advantage for now.